Well, hey, it's good to see you once again. Um, we are right in the middle of a series talking about pursuing gospel-centered community uh, that we began a couple weeks ago, and we've lovingly titled this series, How to Lose Friends and Alienate People. And at first glance, you go, that doesn't sound like gospel-centered community. And you're right. That's, that's actually true. In fact, uh, the, the structure of this series is that we are lovingly unmasking some of these different postures that we take when it comes to community that have nothing to do with community. In fact, they actually are counter to what Scripture would teach us in how to live out community and how we are to be changed. In fact, we've been using a couple of verses, actually three, so that's, that's like a few, right? That's not, I found it's best to just go, we're looking at a passage of Scripture, because that kind of encompasses all. That's all right. You don't need to know this. Moving on. Colossians 3, verses 12 says this, put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts and kindness. And so this is where we started a few weeks ago. Christina presented to us the posture that we take into community that basically says, well, too bad for you. That's not my problem. I've got my own things to deal with. And good luck with that, when in fact, as we put on the new self, right, as we're called to put on something new and to be gospel-centered in our communities, we actually approach it with compassion and kindness that says, your problem is my problem. Now, I'm going to bear this burden with you, and we're going to support one another because of the love of Christ that we have inside of us as an overflow, and then last week, we talked about something really, really easy to, put, to fulfill and to put on, and that is, as we continue on, humility and meekness. The first service didn't get that joke either. That, that's, that's, maybe it's easy for you. I, it's okay. That's great. But that the position or posture that we take into our relationships of you do you, that's focused on me, it's centered on me, and, and doing what's best for me is actually not counting, as Scripture would say, others as more significant than yourselves, but it's counting myself as more significant than others, and how that actually is destructive when it comes to pursuing gospel-centered community. So we jump from something super easy to something even easier today, as we see and we continue on in this passage. It says, clothing yourself in patience, Verse 13, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And above all these on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. Easy, right? Simple. Forgive. Forgiveness. I don't know about you, it just comes natural for me. False. <clears throat> if, you, if you ever hear somebody preaching, hey, I got this down, just, okay, yeah, just, like, just back away, like, mm, okay, lightning, where, there, there, just kidding. But if we follow, I just want to point something out, I think it's really interesting. If we kind of follow the cause and effect here as we, we flow through this passage here, All right? So we've got the, the position of, of gentleness and meekness, right, which are the same thing, but then also the humility before others. It's really the, the approach that I take to others, but that as we see because of that approach now, the response to others and how they treat me, and that is with patience and if it's necessary, forgiveness. So it's almost like a this is where you start and this is how you interact with others as it continues to go forward. So if we're talking about forgiveness today, we're talking about the posture that's counter to presenting forgiveness in community, the title for today's message is, It Is What It Is. Anybody ever used that phrase before? Yes, three of you? Good? Okay. So now it's nodding, right? It is what it is. If we were to define this, it's very simply characterizing Anything that takes place, whether it be a challenging situation or a challenging person, 
as something that cannot be changed and just simply must be accepted. And as I was, I was thinking about and preparing for this message this week, I was wondering, how often do I bring this phrase into my relationships? Or how often, even better, do I use it to simply justify my desire to hold on to an offense, hold on to a grudge, or to simply not extend forgiveness? How often do we do that? Maybe it doesn't look like, oh, it is what it is, and sometimes maybe we actually do say that, but maybe it comes in the form of, well, if I forgive, they're just going to do it again. Right? It's not actually going to change anything. In fact, they probably don't even really care about me or care if I extend forgiveness. Or maybe I feel like the hurt is too big. There's just no way that I could ever get over that. And I, maybe I can forgive, but I'm certainly, I can't forget. Or maybe there's this one. They didn't say sorry to me. I mean, my children say that all the time. Sometimes the children just get older, right? They didn't say sorry to me, so... Or maybe we just don't want to forgive. We just don't want to do it right now. Just not ready. And that's fine, okay? But we have to understand that there's consequences that come with this approach to forgiveness. Because here's the thing. Offense and unforgiveness hurts me not them. Forgiveness, unforgiveness, excuse me, and offenses are the burdens that I carry, not them. And so often we use it as our way of getting back at them, right? But that it actually, in the long run, actually has no effect on them whatsoever. And so, so it's something that falls upon me. In fact, look at Hebrews 12, verses 14 and 15. It says this, Strive for peace with everyone and for the holiness without which no one else will see the Lord. Verse 15, See to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God and that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble. And listen to this, And by it many have become defiled. See, it's... It's a root that takes place with inside of me, and it messes up everything in me, let alone the relationships that I'm holding the offense, the unforgiveness towards. You know, and often there's a, there's a saying that gets thrown around when it comes to stuff like this, and that's, well, time heals all wounds, right? Have you ever heard that one before? That's, that's kind of true. Because time heals all treated wounds. Uh, I love the illustration of this, so let's just say, you know, I I find myself in a knife fight, because sometimes that's what pastors do. We just find ourselves randomly in a knife fight, just swashbuckling away, right? Can you tell I've never been in a knife fight before, right? I know that's, if some people are like, yeah, mm -hmm." okay, so I've watched TV, whatever, right? But let's just say within this, before I become victorious, because that's also what I do, that I get slashed pretty good, right? It's a, it's a nice big gaping wound, and I'm just kind of spilling my guts all over the place. This is great, right? Right before lunch. Is it lunchtime yet? Not quite. Let's just say there's that, and I'm like walking away, and I'm like, well, that'll heal eventually. That'll be okay. I'll just kind of limp along. No big deal, right? Well, let's say I do manage to stop the bleeding, and that's not what kills me, but I just leave it like that and just kind of go about my business, you know, take out the trash, you know, just work in the lawn, that kind of thing. Whatever it takes to just get that thing nice and infected, right? And I go, hmm, it'll heal, no big deal, right? But it begins to really get infected and then can be really, really bad for me physically, if not kill me, right? This is unforgiveness, This is holding on to the wound, going, well, it'll be okay. It's really not that big of a deal. Let me tell you, personally, for me, unforgiveness, it's kind of that thing that God keeps bringing back around for me, and that you have not addressed this. In fact, uh, I I told this story previously. Uh, 
a few years ago, we were very new in our church plant and um, just a small community trying to, to just make things happen, right? And we were following Jesus. And within that, you, you realize that even people, even though they're, they're maybe some of the best people at the end of the day, we're, we're all still people, which means we bring our stuff into that equation, right? And, and through that, as people were kind of walking through, there was a couple of our leaders who were not making some great choices in their life and even um, to some of the things that we had agreed upon, even with morality and, and moral failings type of a thing. And it came to light and found there was some kind of undercutting even of loyalties and just back talking and I say that not talking back to me like my kids, but like behind my back. There we go. And that's what I was trying to say. And it like really wounded me. And it also became this thing where it almost like fractured what little we actually had when it came to cohesiveness and community within this very small thing. And, you know, these two, they, we tried to create community space for them, but ultimately they ended up leaving and it just became this whole thing. And I got to this point where I just got to move on. Just got to push through. We got to deal with this. I'm just, we got, we got work to do. Can't, can't rest here with this. And then I found myself a few months later with one of my very dear friends. And uh, we were out and he just called me on it. He said, you're, Holy Spirit revealed to me, you're really dealing with some unforgiveness still. I was like, no, I'm not. We got stuff to do. He's like, no, you are. And he used the, the illustration of, of, of you're like a ship that's taking on water, that you're, that you're listing. It's beginning to overtake you. And, and before long, it's going to overtake you completely. You'll be submerged. And if you're not careful, it's going to affect everything even more than it already has. In fact, right now, it's affecting all of your relationships, your family, your marriage, you're bringing your unforgiveness into every single thing. And I just thought, well, okay. <laughs> what do I do with that? Because at the end of the day, to be honest, I'm justified in holding on to this offense. Like, they messed it up, and they messed me up. They messed us all up, and they almost blew everything else up. They should get it, right? Anybody ever felt like that? Just, let's be real. The thing is, the desire to see the offenders be punished, to suffer, to feel the same pain that we feel, right? It only fuels the bitterness and the heart of unforgiveness. And the problem is, I'm the one that's carrying all of that. Not them. Now, we would find out later, and I'll finish the story shortly, that they were carrying some of their own stuff in all this, but unforgiveness hurts me, not them. It hurts me, not them. And it affects how I interact with others. And most importantly, it will affect my relationship with the one that actually forgave me, Jesus Christ. It's, a, it's another blockade. And I get it. It's not fair, right? It's not fair. But forgiveness isn't fair. It's unmerited freedom. It's a release. It's the same thing that Jesus did for us when he died on the cross, when he rose again, and he made a way for us to experience true communion with God. See, forgiveness frees you, but it also frees those that offended you. Forgiveness frees you, and it frees them. I want you to look at some of the medical facts alone. I found this is actually, um, Everett Worthington wrote this. He's the executive director for the Campaign for Forgiveness Research. It's a real thing. Go ahead and Google it, because I found it, and you would too. But he writes this. He says, this is really interesting. He says, forgiveness filters into our facial expressions, body posture, and daily life, and reduces their hostility level. When people feel less hostile, they tend to have fewer cardiovascular problems, heart attacks, and to feel less stress. And the less stress a person feels, the better their immune system works. Forgiveness. Medical facts. What does Scripture say? Proverbs 19.11. Good sense makes one slow to anger, and it is to his glory to overlook an offense. To your glory. 
Like it's is good for you. I, I just, you know, I can't say enough that, that the Bible and even the commandments that, that Jesus would call us to when he would say following after him and following after his ways, it's not a, a list of do's and don'ts, but it's actually a way of living a better life. I mean, we have physical, medical research to back it up, that when we hold on to something, it actually can kill you. I mean, think about that. So selfishly, falling after Jesus and extending forgiveness to others is good for me. But when it's talking about kingdom building, which is what it means when we're talking about being in community, whether it's within this body or out in the community where we go, extending forgiveness is good for all of us. It's freedom for all of us. See, when we choose unforgiveness, we choose to suffer and to not be well. That's what we're choosing. Andy Stanley wrote this once. I love this. He said, in the shadow of my hurt, forgiveness feels like a decision to reward my enemy. But in the shadow of the cross, forgiveness is merely a gift from one undeserving soul to another. So let's bring back Colossians then, right? In impatience, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other, as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. So what do we mean when we say that, right? This, this sounds great, but what's the practical way of walking this out? So if we start at the start of when Christ set us free, he gave us he gave us new life in forgiveness of our sins, a debt that we could never pay, right? There's nothing we could do except follow and believe in him as our Lord and Savior and give him our hearts, forgiven, new freedom, right? So what does that mean for me then practically as I walk this out with others? So because of Christ's grace to me, and if you're taking notes, these are the, the bullet points I want to give you today, right? The first thing we'll talk about is that I'll give others the benefit of the doubt. Because of Christ's grace for me, I'll give others the benefit of the doubt. Ephesians 4.2 says this, always be humble and gentle. All right, so we hit that last week, right? Because of that now, it now flows into this next portion. Be patient with each other, making allowance for each other's faults because of your love. Um, I don't know if I've shared this before. I probably have. Because it's, you know, all about transparency, right? But for some reason, when I get into a vehicle, especially one that I'm driving, I feel like my grace meter just goes right through the floor, right? Like, it's like negatives. Like, great. I'm the only one. Some people are laughing, right? Anybody? We, we drive around, and we're just like, really? You cut me off? You trying to outrun me? You want to go? Right? Nobody knows how to interact at a four-way stop. I feel like we're mostly looking at each other. Yes? And forget the roundabouts, right? That's just a matter of, like, sizing up the other guy or gal. Because they're definitely sizing you up. And I'm like, yes, by all means, please almost hit me and come through. Never mind my children in the back seat. Everything is fine. Right? Careless. How dare they? Grace meter goes through the floor right? If, if I want to choose to be offended in all of this, which is the choice I'm making, Lindsay kind of lovingly and piously, I, I make that joke, right? Um, not long ago was like, you know, what if we just give the benefit of the doubt? You know, what if they're trying to get to the hospital quickly, right? Or what if there's an emergency and they're the only ones that can fix the problem that there's an emergency for, or perhaps their, their goldfish is drowning at home. You know, you, you don't know. You don't know what's going, what's going on in that vehicle. But here, here's the thing. Not every bad thing that somebody does with you is actually about you. I, I know, right? I know. Like, maybe they're having a bad day. Maybe they're in a bad mood, 
right? We have no idea what they're going through. Maybe they get on social media and launch into things because they've got no one else to talk to. What if, what if we were to be a people that says, just as Ephesians told us, to be humble and to be gentle? And so we actually took a step back and said, I wonder what's really going on. I wonder what they're really going through. It might change everything. I wonder what's taking place behind the scenes. See, there's a saying, and I know you've probably heard it, right? Hurt people hurt people. When we operate out of our own woundedness, it's not pretty. And we have to understand, just as we've talked a few times, is that just as we give ourselves a break, we've got to be willing to give others a break as well too. Understand that the forgiveness, it's even for them. Think about that. In fact, somebody shared with me in the, the, the previous services that um, they were visiting from out of town, and they said, you know, I've, I've noticed that ever since I put a, a, the church's bumper sticker on my car, I'm a little more cautious with who I'm uh, railing against when I'm driving around. Well, what, if, what if we were to ever actually have that in mind as we went out and about? And I know I keep using the car because that's like my thing, but this is like in any situation, right? It comes to exercising the humility and extending the forgiveness, having thick skin but a soft heart for others. All because of Jesus Christ's grace for me. So in that same thought, the second thing as far as the practicality of walking this out is that I will not label others. I will not label others because I have a tendency, I don't know about you, we, to categorize somebody based on the offense, right? So they lied to me, they stole from me, they talked bad about me, they spread gossip. So therefore they must be a liar a thief, gossip, or they were rude to me, so they're arrogant, or they're careless. And in a sense, I crystallize this person based on the offense, and they'll never be able to come out of that because it is what it is. No, living out of Christ's grace for me says, no, I will not label, I will not judge. In fact, Luke 6, verse 36, you must be compassionate just as your Father is compassionate. Do not judge others. Do not judge others, and you will not be judged. Do not condemn others, or it will come back against you. Forgive others, and you will be forgiven. Think about this. What if it's your lowest moment? Maybe it's a bad choice, or maybe it's just acting out of your own woundedness that somebody decided to freeze you in that spot for the rest of your life. And they said, nope, that's just the way you are. It is what it is. Because that's, in a sense, what we do if we extend judgment, if we, we label, and we say that's just the way it's going to be. That's not forgiveness. That's holding on to an offense. That's not patience. And it's certainly not bearing with one another but it's forgiving. We need to be about forgiving because of Christ's grace and forgiveness to us. See, it's a, it's, that's the, the cause and effect if we're playing through everything, is that because Jesus forgave me, I forgive others. In fact, that's our, our third point this morning, is that I will forgive as I have been forgiven. We've said this so many different times throughout this series, and you've heard it all different kinds of ways, but we need to forgive as we have been forgiven. I was looking at some of my old notes in preparation for this. I like to look back and see what I, I used to say, right, in, in regards to forgiveness especially. And uh, I came across a point that I had put on there. It said, forgiveness is a process, and I sat there and I thought for a second, it's like, I don't think I believe that anymore. Not that there isn't a process after forgiveness of healing, of restoration, but if we're talking about forgiveness, and let's just define that real quickly, and that's 
deciding to release somebody of the debt that they incurred when they injured you. Regardless of what that looks like, forgiveness is not a process. Forgiveness is a choice. It's a choice. It's something that I have to just decide to do. Super easy, right? Right? See, let me tell you something. This is some, some hard-earned wisdom for me, okay? Because if I believe it's a process, the time will heal all wounds, it's just going to go downhill. I'm just going to mess it up. But if I choose to forgive, that begins to change everything. I um, shared that story with those that, that hurt me and were careless in my mind and all this kind of a thing. And a friend called me out on it. I'm like, God, what would I do? And I'll never forget, I was, I was actually had just some time. I don't know how this happened. I didn't, there were no kids around. Uh, Lindsay was off doing something. And it was just me and the Lord, and I was journaling. And, and I just, I felt the Holy Spirit cut me to the core. Just said, you got to reach out to them. I'm, like, I'm not reaching out to them. They got to reach out to me. They're the ones that, please, right? Please. No, you got to reach out to them. So I did what every brave person would do is I pulled out the text machine and decided I'll text them. And we don't have to actually see their faces, right? Right? We, so this, this is what social networking in, has become. And, and so I sat there for me and I'm like, what, do I, what am I going to say? How am I going to do this? And it was, you need to tell them you love them still. Okay, let's do that. So I reached out to them, texted them both separately, of course, because... Group message, not cool, right? No, not in this, not in this sense. But and just said, listen, I've been thinking about you. I want you to know I love you. I'd love to get together sometime if we can. One was not even the same state anymore, so like, look, we can have a phone call. And I just felt it was just this. It was a choice. And, and I'm telling you, you know, Paul talks about in, in scripture when. when Scales just like fell off his eyes. Felt like just this whole new thing, and that's that's the best way I could describe it because it's almost like my whole countenance changed because I was making the first step. Now I did I did have to extend beyond that because it was there was back and forth and conversation, and we finally met or finally called, but it was a whole new level of relief in me when I said, "I want you to know I forgive you." In fact, in one of them, um, I had felt, even before I was called out by my good friend, that I needed to reach out to her and to actually say, hey, I forgive you, and I didn't. I held on to it for whatever great excuse that I had. And in that instance, I actually had to now not only forgive her, but actually ask for my own forgiveness because I wasn't being obedient. That's a fun one. But let me tell you, the miraculous restoration that came within that, not just within our relationships. And things looked different. It's not what it once was. It wasn't getting it back to the way it used to be. But man, I don't have that thing anymore. And it was a miracle that took place in me because it was, it was literally weighing me down. It was affecting every single thing that I was doing. Forgiveness is a choice. There is a process that comes beyond that, and there are other things that would come into play that what forgiveness is not. But what I want to focus on today is the fact that we have to take the first step. We have to be willing to extend, even if it's not reciprocated, even if all of the excuses that you had are true. Forgiveness is a choice. Jesus says this in Matthew 6, and I love this, but it's also very scary. He says, pray then like this, our Father in heaven, how to be your name? Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and here we go, and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. So pause there for a second, because I had a commentary that I was reading this week on this that actually said, this is one of the most frightening lines of scripture in the Bible. Because at its core, what it's translating is saying, hey, God, forgive us in proportion to which we are forgiving other people. Whoa, mic drop, watch out. <laughs> Let me just back away a little bit. 
But then Jesus continues on. If we jump down in the text to verse 14, it says, For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. See, Jesus is saying in the most plain possible language here, that if we forgive others, that God will forgive us. But if we don't, he won't. So think about that in regards to maybe even some of the major hurts. And you would be amazed what this kind of a message stirs up, even in me. But that if I'm unwilling, why should I expect my creator to be willing as well? See, Jesus, in this same sermon, this was the Sermon on the Mount, says earlier in the text, in chapter 5, verse 43, says, you've heard it said, or excuse me, you have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. See, prayer changes things. So if you're struggling with this, pray about it. This is not like a trite, hey, real simple, easy, coffee, Christian coffee mug solution type of a thing. Hey, just pray. No. Bring it to God in prayer. Jesus, help. I want to forgive. I want to believe that you can change things, that it isn't what it is. Echoing scripture, Jesus, help me in my unbelief. Pray about it. Present that. Bring it to the Lord. Give him your heart, just as we talk about that continual renewal, that continual basis. But choose to forgive and to bring that to Jesus. And let him begin the process after that. It's the starting point. Listen, I get it. Sometimes I don't feel like praying it either. But I'll tell you what I have learned a lot of times my attitude comes after I take the action step. I, I didn't want to send the text, and I certainly didn't feel healing before the text. But after I sent it, in faith, God made a way. After I extended the words of, I forgive you. And not in a, let me hold it over your head like, oh, I forgive you. You were terrible, Right? That's not forgiveness, but it's the, I want to forgive because Jesus Christ forgave me. We circle back then to Colossians, bearing with each other, forgive one another, and if any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. If you can, forgive in real time, right, as it's happening. Think about that next time you're cruising social media or around the city in your car. Forgive in real time. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. Because here's the thing, and I'll even speak to some of the the big hurts. Some of you are miserable, and you have no idea why. You've done all the things, and you just kind of try to deal with it. You try to push on. And I get it. Last year was a tough year, and all the years that came before that potentially, or last week was hard, and we're miserable. We're holding on to it. It's, it's literally killing us. Physically, emotionally, and certainly spiritually. And Jesus says, choose to forgive. Let's take the step. Allow me to show you what's next. Because here's the thing. Hurt people will hurt people. But as forgiven people, we should also forgive. As the Lord has forgiven you, you must also forgive. I didn't say it was easy. Maybe I did. But I was kidding. It's certainly not fair. But Jesus calls us to something different, and I believe he's calling you to something better. Better. And that affects all things. 
So I would say today, don't, don't sit on it. Don't, don't let this moment pass without actually addressing the true issue. Because, yes, what they did was not right. What they said does hurt. But unforgiveness is on, is on you. And you have a choice. Do I want to continue to live with that thing that's killing me? Or do I want to, I want to choose to give it up and to move forward and in faith believe that, that Jesus, he knows what he's talking about. And he's going to continue to make a way. Will you just bow your heads with me just as we take just a moment to respond? And I want to do so in a very simple way, um, knowing that it's not easy, but it can be done in a powerful way in which we just posture ourselves in, in humility before Jesus so that we may posture ourselves in humility and forgiveness before others as well. Knowing that because Jesus set us free from our sins, we believe that he can set us free from these things as well. In fact, we may even begin to see miracles take place within our relationships, things we never thought. We thought, we literally believed it is what it is. It's never going to change. But that Jesus would say, nothing is impossible. Nothing is impossible with me. But our part to play is that we surrender. We lay it down. We make the choice to forgive. And so we're, we're, we'll have some prayer teams available. If you're watching online, you'd like prayer, you can reach out to us through that as well. But that I would just say this. Don't miss this moment. That thing... Some of us, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Or there's maybe there's a few things. Or maybe you're like me and you needed a moment of just, God, what is it that I haven't addressed? I've been operating with this thing and it's, it's got me off course. So I'm going to pray. We're going to just take a moment, create that space, and then we'll close. But 